Hello, it's good to have you with us for this service today. This is the second service uh, message called East of Eden, and we're looking at the story of sin in Genesis chapter 4, the Cain and Abel story. If you haven't already seen the first message, it would be good to go back and look at it because a lot of what happens today uh, depends on that. And if you could just pause this video for a moment and go outside to a tree and collect a leaf and bring it with you. It'd be good to have that with you, or maybe you could do it afterwards, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So Genesis chapter 4, we're going to not read the whole chapter this time, we read it last week, but just selected portions of it this week, and we're starting with verse 5. So Cain and Abel have both made an offering to God. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer in the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Then there's a bunch of verses about their descendants that we're not going to read. We pick it up as Lamech says to his wives. Lamech is one of the descendants of Cain. And he says, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, The Lord has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And that's the end of Genesis chapter 4. Any reasonable judge or courtroom system reading this material in the role of a judge would hammer away on their gavel and yell out, mistrial, as loudly as they could. One of the most shocking things about reading this story, and especially about reading the judgment of God, is the injustice of all this to Abel. When you think about how God dealt with Cain, there's no sense in which he made the punishment fit the crime. The whole thing just seems so unfair. I can imagine a lawyer uh, defending Abel, standing up in a shiny suit in a courtroom and saying, this man committed the first murder in the whole world and his punishment, he gets a road trip and a guarantee of protection along the way. It just doesn't seem fair. And when you look at Cain's reactions all through this chapter, the way he responds to things God says to him, uh, there's something really missing in verse 9 when God says to him, where is your brother Abel? What he gets in answer is a lie and a snide remark. I don't know, says Cain, and he knows perfectly well where Abel is. He put him there. Am I my brother's keeper? It's this snide, cold remark that has no uh, sense of remorse in it. And when God punishes him, what you get from Cain is a complaint. No, don't do that. This is too much. I can't bear it. You never see that thing that courts and judges and parole boards look to see in a defendant. Remorse. You never see Cain being sorry for his sins. You never see him repenting. He wails. Oh, no. He's sorry, all right, but only for himself. 
And do you catch the irony in it? He's killed his brother Abel, and he says, oh, no, this punishment is too big. I might get killed. But he doesn't have a sense of that himself as he, as he says those words to God. He doesn't feel like it's unfair because Cain is completely curved in on his own self. And we talked last week about this definition of sin that Luther uh, expounded on, homo incubatus in C, a man curved in on himself. The only thing that matters to him is his own concerns, his own, for his own sake, for his own ends, for his own agenda. He can justify anything. Anything seems reasonable because he's the most important person in the world. He has regrets, sure, but not because he did wrong, only because he doesn't like the consequences. If this were a court, the prosecution would cry, mistrial, loudly. This was a deliberate act. It was an act motivated by an envy of someone else's relationship. It was premeditated. It was covered up, and there is no remorse. And God gives unrepentant Cain this undeserved mercy. In this message, I want to cover four topics, so I know we need to move along. I want to talk about God's dealing with Cain. I want to talk about two cultures. I want to talk about parallels with Jesus in the New Testament and with the Cain and Abel story that we're looking at. And the last is an idea called One Door. The first one, God deals with Cain. Is there punishment for Cain? Yes, there is. But this is certainly not an eye for an eye and a life for a life. God shows Cain that as a result of his behaviour, he's now at enmity with the earth. Three times in his description of Cain's punishment, he talks about the earth or the ground. He says that Cain is cursed from the ground. He's driven away from the ground. When you work the ground, it won't yield its crops. You'll be a restless wanderer in the earth. It's part of Cain's legacy to humanity that we are at enmity with the earth. Another part of God's dealing with Cain is that he keeps giving him every opportunity to repent before the whole thing happens between him and Abel God gives him this stern warning. He says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it or you must rule over it. And Cain pays no attention to that warning. And after it's all happened, when God gives him this judgment, uh, he also gives Cain this protection from the vengeance of other people. His dealing with Cain is very merciful. And there's another odd thing about it. He deals with Cain as if his primary offence in the whole story is against God himself, not against Abel. That issue seems to be set to one side. And it's one of the oddest things about the ministry of Jesus is this same quality. As he goes around and deals with ordinary people and interacts with them, you get him saying over and over again, I forgive you. I forgive you your sins. Even if the sin they made was against someone else. He's always forgiving people their sins. And the Pharisees objected to it because they said he had no right to forgive sins. But the other odd thing about it is he acts as if the primary offence in any sin is against him, not against other people, or apart from the degree to which it's against other people. When people sin, it's an offence to God. Probably the clearest picture of this is in the life of David, who stole another man's wife, got her pregnant, and then murdered that man to cover up his sin. In Psalm 51, David is writing about those events and talking about them, and he says to God, my sin is ever before me against you, and you only have I sinned. What a thing to say. As if he's not accounting for his actions against Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. There's this since in a lot of biblical stories, and certainly in the life of Jesus, that he sets to one side at the moment the offence against other people and deals primarily with the offence of any sin against himself. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Those things will have their day. But he's dealing with Cain primarily with the offence against himself. Abel is not a factor here. God deals with the offence against himself. And the story of God's judgment of Cain irks my sense of justice. 
uh, in spite of Cain's murder, he gets this unlimited and undeserved mercy in how God treats him. He gets the patience of God. He gets this ongoing commitment from God to his own life and survival. Cain's story of his punishment irks my sense of justice until I remember something crucial. Until I remember that as God dealt with Cain, so he deals with me. I identify with the Cain in the story in a way that I never did when I was a kid and read this story in Sunday school. Because like Cain, I am full of my own self. I'm curvatus in C, curved in on myself. Every thought that goes through my head, I think some days, every thought that goes through my head is what I think, what I value, what I will do or not do. My own sins and failings stem from this part of myself and it's offensive to God that we dominate our own lives instead of him. And then I realised that I need the mercy God gave Cain. The second part that we want to look at in this message is the notion that there are two cultures emerging, two ways for people to live in society. In the shadow of Cain, unrepentant Cain, you get vengeful Lamech. And, and we talked in the last message about how he heralded a, a culture, a way of people living, a culture of aggression and oppression and revenge and abuse. But that is not the end of Genesis chapter 4. It ends with God introducing the thought that into this great darkness in the world come, comes an opportunity for light. He says that uh, Eve gave birth to another child, a son, and she named him Seth. The word Seth means granted, she said, because God granted her another son. He was granted from God. He was the gift of God given to her. And human society had another option. The last sentence in this chapter says, from that time on, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And the word call on is a verb that can go two ways. It could be um, call on God or proclaim God. And I like both. I like the thought that in Seth's way of living, in the shadow of his arrival, people began to proclaim to God their need for him and to proclaim to the world around them uh, the way in which God met their need for him. Both hold true. And suddenly there's a new pathway for humanity to live in light instead of in darkness. The prophet Isaiah said that people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the shadow of a la uh, in a land of shadow, dark as death, a light has shone. For unto us a child is given. A child is granted, a gift from God. There are so many parallels uh, between the Cain and Abel story and the story of Jesus and the prophecies parallel them too. And in these two cultures, the one that is curved in on itself uh, is so much like the culture we have around us today. I, I was looking for home decor things in a shop the other day and I could have found a dozen um, little posters or signs or coasters or wall hangs that said things like, be your best self, um, be true to yourself, live your dreams, uh, let no one deny you yourself, all these thoughts about your own self. And it couches it in terms of freedom. Be free to be you, who you truly are. But it turns out that it's not freedom at all. But a man curved in on himself is chained into a way of life that's not really wholesome at all. And, and there are two options, two cultures um, in the ways we can live. One is a culture of power and aggression and endless revenge and abuse of power where self is king. Let no one deny the rights of self. A very popular idea today. Or another culture, a culture of godliness, of service, of mercy and of forgiveness, even forgiveness to the undeserving. In the two cultures, there's two symbolic uses of seven, which is interesting. Do you remember Lamech's boast where he says, if Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech will be avenged 77 times? In the shadow of Cain, this culture of, of relentless revenge. Does that terminology ring a bell in your head at all? Do you 
hear that and think, oh, I've heard something like that before. Do you remember in the New Testament where Jesus was questioned and the question was, how often should I forgive my brother? What a Cain and Abel question. How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And do you remember what Jesus said? Seventy times seven. In the shadow of Cain is a culture of relentless revenge and in the light of the culture of Seth and of Jesus, there is a culture of relentless forgiveness, of abundant, undeserved forgiveness. As Lamech twisted God's words, Jesus in that moment, as he was asked that very Cain and Abel question, he is thinking of Genesis 4 and he twists Lamech's words into a whole new shape, a whole new culture, a whole new way of living. There are so many parallels, and this was the first, third part of this message we wanted to look at. It's Jesus, uh, how the Cain and Abel story parallels Jesus. Abel, like Jesus, was approved by God. Like Jesus, Abel is a story of innocence that has been butchered, and you remember from the first message how we talked about that word, slaughtered, butchered, that uh, uh, Abel was butchered. And the book of Genesis tells us that Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. And in Hebrews 12 and in 1 John in the New Testament, it talks about how Jesus' blood poured out on the ground cries out to God in a louder voice than Abel's blood. Back in 1866, Charles Spurgeon wrote a very famous sermon talking about the, exactly these things, the parallels uh, between the Genesis 4 story and the story of Jesus' life. And he said, blood speaks on high. It has a claim on God's attention and God's justice. And in the cry of Jesus' blood from the earth came also the voice of Jesus that drowned it out, the voice of Jesus who said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The blood demanded justice. But the Lamb of God demanded forgiveness. That notion he had about forgiving people 70 times 7, here he is doing it at the cost of his own life. Uh, another thought in here, and this comes from Timothy Keller's um, wonderful message on this, on this area, is the curse of Cain that Jesus took to himself. Cain makes three complaints to God. He says, I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Jesus said, birds have nests and foxes have holes in the ground, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Cain says, whoever finds me will kill me. And the soldiers of the Pharisees came into the Garden of Gethsemane to find Jesus, uh, a man they couldn't tie down, they couldn't find him. And with Judah's help, they find him and they take him away to Calvary to kill him. Cain complains and says, I will be separated from God and hanging on a cross. Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He lives in separation from God. And the fourth thing we wanted to talk about is uh, the, the, the notion of one door. So we have a little story. Once upon a time, a great king was in a tower talking to his firstborn son about the responsibilities of leadership, and the little boy was miserable. Why can't one of my brothers do it, he said. Look at them out there now. They're comparing the length of their swords, and who will lead them to go out and fight the dogs that are on the corner of the street? Or one of my sisters. They're forever organising morning tea parties or arranging the, cow, the cats of the palace in order of cuteness. Any of them would be better at it than me. You know, I hate court days, all the blaring trumpets and the jewels and the hierarchy of power and how everyone's climbing over each other to get to the top. I'd rather sit back quietly and watch. You know that. Any of them would be a better king than me. And his father smiled and said to his son, it is for just that quality that you sit back and look that will make you a wise and very beloved ruler. And the king was right. There were two great events in that boy's life. One was his coronation and the other was his wedding. The coronation, as it had to be, was an affair of trumpets and robes and hierarchies. But the wedding, he was allowed to organise himself, and so he did. It took him a year to get it all together. And when he was prepared, he sent out invitations, and each one was written on a leaf. When the invitations arrived at the home of all the nobles and courtiers, each of them put on their very best robes and they uh, groomed up their finest horses and they mounted up and they rode into the forest. They followed the directions and came to a part of the forest where a great fence was built 
all around a section of the forest. And from gaps in the fence, they could look in, and they could smell delicious food, and they could hear music, very subtle music, playing a harp and maybe a flute. It was very lovely. They could see that the people in there were dressed in new white robes that each person was given. It looked lovely. And so the nobles rode around the perimeter of that big fence, but they couldn't find the doorway to get in, and they rode away disappointed. Two of the great ladies of court climbed down off their high horses and walked around the perimeter, and eventually they came upon, upon the gateway. But when they saw it, their lip curled in horror. So they looked down at the robes they were wearing, all the silk and the jewels that they had put on, the very best they had for this event. And they looked again at that door and shook their heads and went away. In the end, the young son's wedding was attended mostly by children, uh, a washerwoman was one of the witnesses to it all. A blacksmith came and gave them a cheer, and several old men who had been happy to get down on their hands and knees. You see, the prince had made the doorway to his wedding very, very low, and you had to crawl to get in. God loves humility. And repenting is a humble business. And repentance is the pathway to salvation. It's not the goal of it, but it's the only way you're going to get in to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The story of Genesis 4 is a story of a mistrial. We are all as guilty as Cain is of being curved in on ourselves. All of humanity lives east of Eden, but the misjudgment and the mistrial has been in our favour. We don't deserve it, but it's the mercy of God that we are given it. And we get to choose whether we will perpetuate a culture of darkness or a culture of light, a culture where we are curved in on our own self or where we are opened up to our Heavenly Father. And everyone, everyone in the world has an invitation. Every leaf on the planet is filled with the fingerprints of God and he invites all of humanity into his kingdom. And there's only one door, and that's through repentance, a humbling business where you put off all the best that you've done and you accept the righteousness of God in place of your efforts. May God be part of your life this week and help you make sense of these extraordinary stories he gave us to understand sin. Amen.